Earlier, I sat down with a man who many think could be the first American Pope, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, the Archbishop of New York. Cardinal, thank you so much for joining us. I'm the one who's grateful, Nora. Blessed Easter. Blessed Easter to you. What is your message for Holy Week? Oh, listen, what should we think of? What are you covering on this show? You're going to talk about Ukraine. You're going to, we're going to recall the slaughter in Boston a year ago. Uh, you look at all the darkness, the dreariness, the reasons to be sad and defeated in the world today. And what does Holy Week and Easter talk about? What is Passover talking about? The victory of good over evil, light over darkness, life over death. We believe, Jews and Christians, believers, uh, hold uh, fast to the truth that God has the last word. You know, we have been doing polling at CBS News for decades, mm -hmm. and we just found in our last poll that now more people than ever feel that the church is in touch with their needs. Good to hear. Why do you think that is? I think at a practical level, especially for us as Catholics, it's got to be Pope Francis. He has really ignited the imagination of the world. And for once, if finally, it's almost like people are saying, wow. There's reason to cheer, there's reason to hope, there's a good guy, the good guys are winning uh, in the church. People want the church to succeed. People want religion and faith and spirituality to work. People in general are on the side of virtue and goodness and everything that's noble and decent in the human person. And when you see somebody like Pope Francis that can tap into that and just seems to emanate that and call, forth, call that forth from everybody, people kind of take a second look at religion and say, wow, but Maybe what, belief is worth it. But what <clears throat> is it about Pope Francis? I wish I knew, and I wish he could bottle it, because I'd order a case, because <laughs> <laughs> I need it. What is, you know what I think it is? Two words, sin sincerity and simplicity. We have a, a world that can kind of detect frauds. We have a world that is a little tired maybe of marketing and polls and PR stuff. And here you've got a guy who is just so genuine and simple and sincere. He doesn't need anybody to script him. He doesn't need any pro to say, you ought to go there, you ought to do this. He just does it with a genuineness and a naturalness that people are shaking their head and saying, this guy's the real thing. There's a question, however, about whether it's a lot of style and whether it's been mm -hmm. matched yet by substance sure. in terms of reforms of the church. I mean, he has, for instance, apologized for predator priests mm -hmm. in the sexual abuse scandal, mm -hmm. but he's not yet met with victims mm -hmm. of sexual abuse by mm -hmm. priests. Should he? I think he should, and I think he will. Pope Benedict did. Uh, so I think he will. We got to give him some time. He knows that's a towering problem. You know what he's showing us, Nora? You remember last year, you were, I think you were there you during know. the conclave and the congregations that met ahead of time. Those 10 days before we actually sealed ourselves in the Sistine Chapel and the College of Cardinals met in confidence every day, we spoke our mind and Jorge Bergoglio, who was there, listened intently. And now we know it for sure because he's doing a lot of the stuff that the Cardinals said, this has got, this has got to be taken care of. The Cardinal spoke about the sexual abuse of minors and said, we cannot run from this, we cannot deny this. This is a hideous, deep wound in the life of the, of the church and it must be addressed head on. He's doing that. We also saw Pope Francis <clears throat> wash the feet of 12 people, including a Muslim and a woman. Mm -hmm. How remarkable is that? Is that beautiful? And you know where that comes from, the Last Supper that was on Holy Thursday. We do that. I did that at, at St. Patrick's. I had 12 young people. Uh, from but the, last year was the first time he did a woman that, wash the Or any pope did. You're right. But you are, you're on to something. When Pope Francis said, uh, I, want kind of a, I want these 12 people to symbolize every religion, both sexes, every background. And to think that he did it at a prison. I mean, here's the Pope, whom we believe represents Jesus on earth, we Catholics believe that, kneeling down and washing the feet and kissing the feet of those 12 people. Powerful gesture. Mm -hmm. It was interesting to hear the Pope say in Mass that he occasionally feels bored or lonely. When was the last time we heard a Pope talk about loneliness? Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is, a, yeah, he, actually, Nora, when's the last time we heard Popes speak about themselves? I'd like to attribute it to the fact that not only is he a genuine, good human being, he's also a, he's a Jesuit, as you know. Now, part of the Jesuit spirituality, Jesuits were founded by St. Ignatius Loyola. St. Ignatius says, you know, part of the data, part of the stuff of our prayer and our meditation and our talking to God are our own experiences. When he talks about his grandma, when he talks about growing up, when he talks about falling asleep, 
uh, when he talks about boring homilies. When he, t <laughs> those are good things, and most people in the, wor in the world are saying, "Oh wow, I'm glad I'm not by myself." Even the Pope falls asleep sometimes when he's saying his prayers. <laughs> what changes do you think the Catholic Church will make? Whenever you talk about change, reform, transformation, which are big words, which Jesus often talked about, first and foremost, we're always talking about what? Inside, in the human heart. Conversion of life, going from selfishness to selflessness, going from sin to grace, going from hate to love, going from bitterness to forgiveness. That's the kind of change, conversion, uh, transformation that is at the heart of the, of the Christian method, message. Now, you've heard Pope Francis say that. He says, first and foremost, I got to change myself, and then I got to call all of you to the kind of authentic change, the invitation to conversion of heart that it's at the core of, of the message of Jesus. So that's the basic change. But I think we'll see some change in structure. We already see a change in style. You'd use that word, uh, and I'm glad you did, Nora, five minutes ago. I think the question that, that, that Catholics <clears throat> and many have in watching the church is, Yes, there's been a stylistic change. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've seen public opinion change and people feel more connected with the church. Now comes the question about what real reforms will the church make? And I hear from you that, that it's internal, that there aren't yeah. any plans for any changes at the church. And we can't diminish that. But you gotta, you gotta remember, Norrin, uh, Christianity, like Judaism, is a revealed religion. It's an inherited religion. We believe that God has told us certain things about himself and ourselves. And we can't tamper with that. Now, we can kind of redirect the way we teach it or express it. And boy, this Pope's doing that on steroids. But to the substance of it, can't, can't, can't. Sometimes we wish we could, okay? I wish I could change, for instance, the Lord's teaching on forgiveness. Because there are certain people in my life I find it very difficult to forgive. But I can't change it because it comes right from Jesus. He calls us to forgive people. I wish he didn't. I got to try to change my life to meet up to his teaching, not to tamper his teaching. Really? Who, who would you not, who can you not forgive? Oh, listen, I better not, <laughs> I better not tell you. But I'm, I'm kind of using that as an example of a very tough teaching of Jesus. Most of the time when we think of the tough teachings we want to change, you know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Sexual stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Divorce and remarriage, uh, our, our abortion, our homosexuality. Those are the things most of the time. When you look at Jesus, and Francis has reminded us, what are the real tough teachings he gives us? Well, faith in him, even when life gets tough. Hope in him, even when things are very depressing. Uh, forgiveness, love, mercy, reaching out to those who do everything in the world not to deserve our love. Those are tough teachings that I wish sometimes Jesus would soften, but he's not, and I gotta pass those on, and I can't tamper with them. We've seen a <clears throat> remarkable change in the United States in terms of public opinion and legal rights for gay Americans. Yeah. Do you believe that civil unions are wrong? Here's what I believe. I believe that marriage is a given by God because I'm a man of faith, but also in the human psyche and human reason in uh, in the natural law, that marriage at its essence is between a man and woman forever, lovingly, faithfully, to bring forth new life and children. I believe we can't tamper with, with that. Um, would I do things to protect the civil rights of those who are unable to live up to that? You bet I would, whether that became insurance, whether that become, became housing, whatever. Do I believe that society could be affected negatively if we tamper with the definition of marriage? Yeah. And that's just not as a man of faith. That's just as a, as I like to think, a loyal American. That that we, if we tamper with that essential uh, of human relationships, marriage, we're sooner or later come, going to come to regret it. But you've seen the polling. <clears throat> I mean, that's oh, yeah. way out but, of step with <clears throat> most Americans now. And I say that a majority of you Americans, even Republicans. Yeah, but you know what? We're used to being out of step. Like immigration, capital punishment. The church is out of step on that too. The polls show that our people aren't with us. So we keep saying, well, our job is to teach it, to call people, to try to convince people, to invite people. Even when the polls are against us, uh, we got to keep at it. 
I noticed that you invited former Governor Jeb Bush on your radio program. Yeah, and he's going to come to town, you know, yes. to, to help us plug our Catholic schools. Yeah. So are you pro-Jeb Bush? <laughs> <laughs> I like Jeb Bush a lot, whether I'd, I'm, I'm, whether I'd be for him as a presidential candidate or not, I don't know personally, but I sure admire him, and I especially appreciate the priority he gives to education and immigration, by the way. Mm -hmm. And why do you admire him? Well, because he, uh, if I, I found him, as I, as I looked at what he did in Florida, Nora, I found him remarkably innovative. He was almost like for education what Franklin Roosevelt was for the economy. He said, darn it, let's see what works. We can't do business as usual. We got to help our public schools. We know that they're terribly flawed. What can we do to improve them? And he experimented and he went out on a limb and a lot of things and, and things began to click in Florida to such that he's rightly proud of this progress that he made in education. And if you don't mind me blowing our own horn here, he says one of the best things going is Catholic education. A champion, certainly, of Catholic education. Yeah. So would you like to see him run for president? Yeah, I think he, I sure think he'd bring something. Yeah, he'd be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else you'd like to see run for president? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, Pope Francis. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you about one of the cases that is before the Supreme Court. It's mm -hmm. known as the Hobby Lobby case, and they're considering whether private companies yeah. should be exempt from the Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare, and yeah. the mandate about whether to provide contraceptive sure. coverage to their employees. Where do you stand? I, I would be inspired by the Hobby Lobby. I think they're just true Americans. They're saying, look, the, the genius of America is that uh, religious convictions affect the way we act. America is at her strongest, at her best, when people can bring everything into the public square, including their moral, ethical, spiritual, and religious convictions. And the government should never force us to do anything that is contrary to those deepest held convictions. That they're fighting for that, willing to go all the way to the Supreme Court, boy, they, I, they sure have my admiration. But doesn't that set a dangerous precedent if a private company can use religion to mm -hmm. deny benefits to its employees? It, it could, and as you know, they're arguing that. And the Supreme Court in the past, if I understand correctly, has said, in general, the bias is on the side of the rights of conscience and, and religious liberty. There may be occasions when that is so detrimental to the common good that it will outweigh it. Is this one of them? I mean, is, is the... Uh, is is the the ability to to buy contraceptives that is now that are now widely available my lord all you have to do is is walk into a a 711 or any shop on any street in america and have access to them is that right to access those and to have them paid for is that such a towering good that it would suffocate the rights of conscience i don't think so but i hope the supreme court agrees Monday is the anniversary of the Boston Marathon. Yeah. In the year since, what has inspired you about the people of Boston? Well, far be it from a New Yorker to compliment Boston, but let me, okay? Uh, I, was, I found myself uh, uh, cheering on my friend Cardinal Sean O'Malley, the Archbishop of Boston, the pastor, who expressed such gratitude for Boston. Boston has risen up. It's, it's an Easter story, if you want to talk about it. It's a Passover story. Boston has risen up from carnage, from death, from darkness to, to the most nauseating type of, of attack on a civilized society and, a, and an event that brings people together. They've risen from that. And, and the victims of that, their families, the whole Boston community has reminded us once again of the message of Easter. Life is stronger than death. Hope is stronger than despair. And we're not going to let this evil we're not going to let this evil uh, destroy us. Life goes on, and probably stronger and grittier than before because we've come through that darkness. I, I thank them for that. Indeed. Cardinal Dolan, thank you thank so much. Thank you, Nora. Good being with you.